Gaura Vibhava Bhumes Twam Nir Desesha Sajana Priyam Vaishnava Sarva Bhoma Sri Jagannathaya Te Namaha Vanchakalpa Daru Vishya Kripa Sindhu Pebacha Petitanam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnava Bhyo Namaho Namaha Namo Mahavadanaya Krishna Prema Padaya Te Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namadi Gauda Chuste Namaha Panchatattva Makam Krishnam Bhakta Rupa Hey Krishna, Karuna Sindhu, Dina Bandhu, Jagatpate, Gopesha, Gopika Kanta, Radha Kanta, Namostate. Dayatam Sarato Pangor Namabamanda Matir Gati Matsarvasya Padambo Jo Radha Madhavan Mohano Divya Rinda Kalpa Drumada Sri Ratnaga Sri Singara Ratnagara Sto Sri Sri Radha Srila Govinda Devos Pristali B Savyamanam Smarami Srimad Rasadar Sarambi Bamsi Vata Tatastitaha Karsan Venu Tata Gopir Gopinath Te Namaha Tapta Kanchana Gaurangi Radhe Vrindavane Swari Rikabhanu Suti Devi Pranamami Hari Priye Vanchakalp Sindhu Bhe Bhaja Tita Nam Pavane Bhyo Vaishnava Bhyo Namaha Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And so the life of Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati is quite amazing. He is a, we call a ray of Vishnu, a person who was sent directly from the spiritual world to do this work in the material world. He's not, he didn't come here under karma. He came as a messenger. He is an eternal siddhya. He's a liberated soul. He came to do this work on behalf of Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. When Lord Chaitanya's movement was, uh, when Lord Chaitanya disappeared and 1534, and for about 150 years his movement continued with his followers. After that time, many of the major, many, many of his followers left the planet. And there were only a few at that time to keep Lord Chaitanya's teachings and his movement alive, and that was Baladev Vidya Bhusan and uh, Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur and a few others. Gradually, many uh, us Sampradayas, people who were claiming to follow Lord Chaitanya but didn't have the credibility nor the understanding, were claiming either being sons of Lord Nityananda or Lord Chaitanya or creating their own Sampradayas, and this went on from about another 150 years uh, till, till Srila Bhakti Vinod Thakur in the beginning of the 1800s appeared. He was the first of three to come to establish, re-establish Lord Chaitanya's true teachings. And one of the first things he did was First, he came across the uh, book on the life, on the life and teachings of Lord Chaitanya, and uh, he also came across Chaitanya Charitamrita in Bengali. Before then, he was a shakta, a worship of the energy of the Lord, not the Lord directly, Durga worshiper. But he transformed after coming in contact with these literatures, and then he started to formulate and preach Christian, Lord Chaitanya's teachings again. And he was by, practically by himself. There was hardly anyone, only a few other devotees. 
And he had to fight very strongly against all of these wrong philosophies and teachings that were going on in the name of true religion. You find that even today. You go to India, you find so many bogus swamis there. They have their big followers, they have their big podiums, and they're quite wealthy, and they preach whatever they preach. <laughs> It's usually that I'm an incarnation of some, uh, something, and then you should follow me, and I'll give you all kinds of power, and you'll be able to make your pre your secretary pregnant without even touching her. Yeah. So all of these uh, guys, they're still running around in the Western world. <laughs> it's a fact. So. Um, Bhakti Vinod Thakur really fought hard, but he realized he couldn't do it alone, so he prayed towards the end of his life. Although he wrote more than 100 books and periodicals and gave speeches and uh, in so many different ways, started newspapers. And of course, in 1896, the year, the same year Srila Prabhupada was born, he sent that book, The Teachings and Precepts of Lord Chaitanya, to some of the major universities around the world. They went to universities in Europe and in uh, the western areas of the world, such as McGill University and other universities. Uh, he wrote many, 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 and gave many, many speeches, but Still, those opera sampradayas were quite strong because they had established themselves themselves for so many years. And he prayed, "My dear Lord, please send me someone to continue this fight to establish Lord Chaitanya's true teachings. I am all alone. Send one from your special entourage to come." And little did he know it that it was his fifth son who was Bhimala Prashad, who appeared on at 3.30 p.m. on February 17th, uh, 17, no, 1874. At 3.30 p.m., February 17th, 3.30 in the afternoon. And uh, when he appeared, it was interesting because he didn't appear simply like a ordinary person. The umbilical cord, which connects the mother to the child, was wrapped around his body like a Brahmin thread. <laughs> so this was the first sign that here is a very special personality. His father, Bhakti Vinoda Kaur, had gotten a place right on Grand Road, which was where Lord Jagannath passes for his Ratha Yatra in, in Jagannath Puri. That place is still there. Now it's a, it's a major temple. And that was the house of Bhakti Vinoda Kaur. Bhakti Vinoda Kaur had um, 10 children. Some people say 13, but he had a big family, <laughs> no doubt. And um, he was also the magistrate in the Jagannath Temple. He was given that service to, again, realign the worship of Lord Jagannath. And so he worked very hard to do that, and he was quite successful. When he was away, the Rathayatra was there, and his son was only six months old. So when the Rath cart passed his house, it stopped right in the front of his house. And his mother, the wife of Bhakti Vinod, who name, whose name was Bhagavati, Bhagavati Devi, she took the young child and brought it onto the cart and placed it at the lotus feet of Lord Jagannath. Now, Lord Jagannath is big. Those of you who've been to Puri, you know, he's about, he's about, uh, yeah, he's about two meters high. <laughs> and one meter wide, he's big. <laughs> so uh, so that big, the deity is there, Jagannath Baladev Subhadra. And she placed him there to get the blessings. And then a very interesting event happened. Jagannath's big garland fell 
from him and circled around the, the baby who was there, right there below. Uh, when his mother saw that, she was quite amazed. And then when she told her father, his, fa his father, Bhakti Bhano, when she came, then he could understand, yes, my prayer has been answered. This is the personality that will come and spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. So we give credit to Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati as the person who really spread Krishna consciousness all over the world. Prabhupada did the work, or did, did this, but it was Bhakti Siddhanta's idea, and he had sent his followers to different places around the world to spread Krishna consciousness. It was only our Srila Prabhupada who was successful. Other His other <coughs> disciples, they didn't have much success. They came back uh, with some tokenism, but nothing really solid. So that was when he was um, six months old. When he grew up, the first incident we hear is when he was four years old. He uh, had taken a mango that was meant to be eaten, sent, uh, meant to be re offered to the deity and he had eaten the mango himself at four years old. <clears throat> so it was boga. So his father, Bhakti Vinod Dakor, chastised him and said, oh, in a very mild way, what you have done is not good. This is for the deity you have taken before him. We, never, we always offer first to the Lord. So that child, who was only four years old, he took it very seriously. And he made a vow at four years old never to eat mangoes his whole life. And when his followers would bring him mangoes, he would say, I'm sorry, I cannot take, I'm a vendor. And now, it's easy in Western countries, how often do we get mangoes? <laughs> but if you live in India, there's the mango season. And that starts around May. May and June, and a, and a beautiful, and everybody has mangoes for everything. Mango chutney, mango lassi, mangoes. They make mangoes, and mangoes are big and, and orange and sweet and juicy, and it's very healthy, too. If you eat one mango, you got enough energy for you know, the whole morning. <laughs> so, yeah, mangoes are really sought after in India. And so he never took a mango his whole life. That was a great austerity. And many times he was offered mangoes. Um, his father, after the course, uh, before that incident happened, when he was 10 months old, his father moved to Rangagat in Nadia, Bengal, and left Jagannath Puri. By the age of seven, he memorized the whole Bhagavad Gita <laughs> and could recite it also, seven years old. He went to school, but he never got, he never read any books except Bhagavad Gita and, uh, and other religious books, and still he got the best marks in the class. Because <laughs> he would simply listen to the class and remember what everything was said, and then he would, he would have that memory. At the age of seven, his father gave him a deity of Kormadev, and he worshipped that. His father also, at, at the age of seven, gave him Tulsi beads and taught him to chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra and the mantra for Lord Nisringadev. That when he was seven years old. When he was 11 years old, he invented a particular style of shorthand. You know what shorthand is? Shorthand is when somebody, usually secretaries, learn shorthand. When their bosses dictate, they write, and they write in codes. And then later, after they write in codes, the, the boss will dictate real fast, and they'll just write in codes. And then they take those codes later and expand it into actually the, the, the words. So that's called shorthand. It's a style of writing in codes. He invented his own style, <laughs> which became popular. It was called Bicanto. So he uh, he was a genius. At 18, he entered college, but didn't read any of the books. <laughs> Sounds like me. 
I didn't like school at all. <laughs> uh, read, he read philosophy books instead and went to the libraries. He read every book in the library and he memorized everything. He had such a, he had a photographic memory that everything he read, he could remember. Everything he saw, he could remember. He never forgot anything his whole life. And he was, uh, what they call it, uh, what do they call that? Uh, um, Udareda. Udareda means he, he remained celibate his whole life from the time he was born all the way to the time he left the world. Um, in 1897, obviously he was about 23 years old at that time, he developed some knowledge of astronomy and astrology and he published a work called Surya Siddhanta, which became famous and popular and used by others. Uh, he was an astrologer, also studied astronomy, but he didn't give it much attention. He just wrote the book and forgot about it. <laughs> he was a genius at, the, at a young age. In 1898, Bhakti Vinod moved to Swajana, Swananda Sukanda Kunj. And there he held discourses uh, on various philosophical teachings that one great personality would come to hear him, and that was Gorky Shore, thus Babaji Maharaj. And uh, he would always listen to Bhakti Vinod Thakur's lectures. Uh, Gorky Shore Das Babaji Maharaj uh, uh, was a renunciate. He never had any interest in becoming a spiritual master. And he had refused in many times to accept people as disciples. He would always say, I'm not qualified to accept disciples. And then when people would really want to become his disciples, he would make it impossible for them. <laughs> because he would live on the banks of the river on an, uh, in an overturned boat, upside down boat. He would live underneath the boat <laughs> and he would just chant there. And sometimes when, when uh, people who were very materialistic would come to get his darshan, he moved to the outhouse where people passed stool and urine. So he was, he was living right next to the outhouse. And then people would come and say, I want to be your disciples. He would say, okay, you come and live with me here. And that was the end of that. There was no disciples. <laughs> so you didn't make it so easy. <laughs> so, but Bhakti Thakur wanted to give his son, whose name was Bhimala Prashad, a, you know, the best. So he said, you should take initiation from Gorky Shore. Because Bhakti Siddhanta, who Bhakti uh, Bhimala Prashad, who later became Bhakti Siddhanta, uh, would always see this great personality, and he would admire him, but he would never speak to him. So one day, uh, on the order of his father, he went and approached Gorkishore Das Babaji for uh, initiation. Gorkishore Das Babaji Maharaj said. I'm sorry, I don't accept disciples. Go somewhere else. <laughs> so he went back to his father, Bhakti Vinod. Bhakti Vinod Thakur said, no, you must become his disciple. You have to do whatever it takes to become his disciple. Fine, you know. So now he's trapped between two things that seem to be impossible. So he goes back and this time he begs, really, you know, you are the greatest of all of the spiritual teachers. I don't see anyone I can actually surrender to except you, so please accept me. Gorky Shardas Babaji Siddhartha said, uh, well, I'm going to have to ask Lord Chaitanya, so you come back in three days. So he came back in three days and he asked him, when he came, again fell at his feet, begged for mercy. He said, did you ask Lord Chaitanya 
And Gorky sure does Baba Di Bar and said, I forgot <laughs> to ask him. <laughs> so he left and he said, but come back tomorrow and I will ask him. So he came back the next day, third time. Again, he fell at his feet and was begging. He said, did you ask Lord Chaitanya? Yes. What did he say? He didn't answer. <laughs> so now what to do? So he thought, well, I can't have a spiritual master and the goal of life is to worship the Lord by accepting a bona fide spiritual master. I don't see anyone else who could become my mirror. So this human life is wasted. So he decided to end his life. So he was walking on a bridge and he was going to throw himself off the bridge. But Gorky Shore Das Babaji just happened to be coming the other way at that time. And he said, stop, don't do that. I was just testing you. I wanted to see how sincere you are. I can see you are qualified, so I will accept you. And he gave him initiation and he gave him the name. Sri Varshabhanavi Devi Daitaya. Sri Varshabhanavi Devi Daitaya, which is a name for Srimati Radharani. <laughs> gave him a name of Radharani, beautiful name. So now he's initiated and uh, And then there was one famous scholar, his name was Radha Ramanchara Das. He was a famous scholar. And he was he would chant the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, but he would chant Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. And so of course that's not wrong. Mm -hmm. Prabhupada said, well, you chant Hare Krishna first or you chant Hare Ram first. It doesn't matter because when you keep chanting, it just keeps going. <laughs> but the reason why we chant Hare Krishna first, because the scriptures do also mention Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. You'll find that in some scripture. The reason why we do Hare Krishna first is because Lord Chaitanya taught it that way. So we are followers of Hare, of uh, Lord Chaitanya. So we follow Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So this Radha Raman Charan, he was a scholar, but he had he concocted his own mantra. Bhajanitai Gaur Rathe Sham Japa Hari Krishna Hari Ram. <laughs> and he was chanting that. <laughs> Bhaja Nitai Gaur Rathe Sham Japa Hari Krishna Hari Ram. So uh, Bhakti Siddhanta and uh, Bhakti Vinota Kaur became angry. And they were trying to say, This is a bogus mantra. You can't do that. Take mantras from different places and play, put it into one. So Prabhupada, Prabhupada dealt with that mantra. He changed, he said, we can chant Bhaja Nittai Gaur, Had, uh, Nittai Gaur Rade Sham Jai Krishna Balaram. <laughs> Prabhupada took that one and added and did it in his own way. Jai Nittai Gaur Rade Sham Hare Jai Nittai Gaur Rade Sham Jai Krishna Balaram. I think you see when... Uh, um, Beer Krishna Maharaj comes, he always likes to chant that mantra. So Prabhupada changed it to a, to the actual way to do it. So he was chanting this. So there was a, there was a little argument going on and then finally uh, Bhakti Vinod Thakur stopped the argument because it was getting too heated between uh, Bhakti Siddhanta and this uh, Babaji Radha Raman Charan. In uh, 1911, um, there was a uh, debate at a place called Midnapur. At that time, the Brahmins were very strong and they were saying, if you're born in a Brahmin family, you're a Brahmin. Mm, that's all. It's by Janma, 
not by karma. Karma could be there, but janma is the qualification. So, and Bhakti Vinod Thakur wanted to challenge that and saying, no, actually, if you're born in a Brahmin family, you have an advantage of becoming a Brahmin, but you have to show the qualities of a Brahmin and the activities of the Brahmin. So, <clears throat> there was a debate in the place called Mindapur <clears throat> on September 9th, I think, believe it was, September 9th, it was supposed to be for three days. <clears throat> They were going to debate, all the Brahmins were going to come, and Bhakti Thakur was going to represent the Vaishnavas. But he got sick, and he got rheumatic fever, and he was bedridden, he couldn't go. But he was wondering what to do. We'd have to, we have to challenge these rascals. And so his son, at that time, Sri Varsha Banavi Devi Dayetaya, he had written a book called Brahmins and Vaishnavas. You can still find his book. It circulates around ISKCON. And he wrote on the topic establishing that Vaishnavas are superior to Brahmins. <clears throat> that a Vaishnava is automatically a Brahmana, but a Brahmana is not automatically a Vaishnava, and a Brahmana has to live according to the qualities and activities of a Brahman before they can actually be called a Brahman. So he showed the book to his father, Bhakti Vinod, and Bhakti Vinod, of course, said, you are the person to go, so you go. So he represented his father, and then the, the, big, the debate began. And so Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, who was, of course, he wasn't that at that time, his name was Bar Sri Varsha Banabi Devi Daitaya, he came. And he was the first one to speak. The Brahmins were there. And he started to glorify by reciting Jai Sisi Panchatattva Ki Jai. He started to glorify the Hare Krishna. Sri Advaita Charya Ki Jai. Sri Nityananda Rama Ki Jai. Gaur Gaur Garanga Mahaprabhu Ki Jai. Gadadhar Das Ki Jai. Sri Vas. So beautiful. And so, <clears throat> um, he started to quote verses from the Shastras glorifying the Brahmanas. And the Brahmins were there listening as Bhakti, well, of course, Sri Varshavanavi Devi Daita started to glorify the Brahmins. And the Brahmins were thinking, He's on our side. <laughs> but then, after halfway through his lecture, he changed. But he said, actually, um, if a Brahmana is not, uh, born in a Brahmin family does not make one a Brahmana. One has to do by Janma, and he quoted that verse by Narada Muni, that it's by qualification and not by, by birth. And then he started glorifying the Vaishnavas. And then the brahmanas were start getting a little nervous because he was so eloquent and so powerful and so shastric in his presentation that the brahmanas couldn't say anything. They actually started to get up and left, leave. <laughs> they realized we can't, we can't say anything. And so the people who came to witness this debate, they got so excited. Here's a great sadhu. So they ran to Bhakti Siddhanta, and they wanted to touch his feet. <laughs> so you can imagine a hundred people wanting to touch your feet at the same time. <laughs> so it's a little dangerous. <laughs> so fortunately, the police officers were there, and they stopped the crowd, and then what they did, they took Bhakti Siddhanta in the back room, washed his feet with buckets of water, and threw all the water on the crowd, <laughs> and everyone was satisfied. <laughs> So that it really he really establishes the position of that was a landmark uh, victory for the Vaishnavas because that really pushed the populator population of the Vaishnavas up. <coughs> uh, let's see, Gorky Shore Das Babaji left the world on November seventeenth, nineteen fifteen. 
and a fight ensued about taking his body and establishing it. So the Babajis said, well, he's a Babaji, and therefore we have right to his body. But Bhakti Siddhanta was the only disciple and so he wanted a challenge because he knew these Babajis were bogus. And he said, oh, you are Babajis? Well, my, my spiritual master, he is a resident of the spiritual world. To touch his body, you have to be pure. And so, therefore, you can take his body if, if any if you have not invo got involved with any illicit activities in the last month. And nobody said anything. Then he said, in the last week. In the last three days. And when he gave, and then he said, in the last day, and uh, slowly, one by one, all the Babajis turned and walked away. A police officer was there. He was watching. He was shocked to see all of these Babajis who claimed to be Babajis who were having illicit activities with ladies on the side and calling themselves Babajis. <laughs> so it goes on all the time, <laughs> even today. <laughs> Um, so he established uh, a samadhi for his spiritual master, and he was he put it on a particular place um, in Navadweep. Later on, sixteen years later, a flood came, and it washed away everything in that area. So he took that uh, that <clears throat> that body of his spiritual master and reestablished it now in the area of Mayapur. In the uh, Chaitanya Mat, if you go there, it's just down the street from our Mayapur Chandradaya, and he established Bhakti Siddhanta. Uh, I mean, uh, Gorky Shore does Babaji's Samadhi Mandir there, and beautiful, and beautiful deity of uh, Gorky Shore does Babaji. Um, <clears throat> of course, his 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 uh, his father left the world the year before, and then his guru left the, year, the world the year after. So in about 15 months, both his spiritual master and his father left the world. Now he was practically alone, and he was thinking, how can I carry on? But then one night, when he was in anxiety, how to carry on? The Panchatattva appeared to him in a dream, along with his spiritual master and his father, Bhakti Thakur. He said, you continue on, we are with you. We are with you. So he took heart from that dream, and he became enthusiastic to continue to try to reestablish Lord Chaitanya's mission. Because many of these groups were still quite prominent. And then... In the year mm, 1918, he took sannyas at the age of 44. And there was nobody to initiate him into sannyas because he, his spiritual master was gone. So he did it himself. Using the rituals from the Sri Sampradaya, he initiated himself and then he was known as Sh Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Thakur. <laughs> Sometimes people criticize him for doing that. But he he showed that he was actually a real sannyasi. He took a picture of his Guru Maharaj and stood in front of that picture. It was March 29th, 1918. And using the rites of the Ramanuja Sampradaya, he initiated himself into... And then his preaching started to really develop. Many star people started to come. In the same year, he found a house which was going to be used as a temple, Uta Danga Junction Road. Now today, today, just today, 
It's already started at 9 a.m. Indian time, which means it's about, uh, that was about four and, a, four and a half hours ago. They're having a huge ceremony at that same place because that was the first temple established by the Gaudiya Math by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati. That place is under renovation now. We, after decades, we were trying, ISKCON was trying to get that land and get that building. We finally got it. I mean, it cost us a lot of money because people knew the historical importance of that building. And today there's a big ceremony, and I think they said that the ceremony was go it will be going on for hours and hours and hours. There's a link that you can go and see, you know, maybe you would like to take a look and see what is happening there. So that was the first temple established by Bhakti Siddhanta, and that's memorable because in the year 1922, after preaching there for four years, that's when our Srila Prabhupada came to meet Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and that first meeting was in that same building on the roof. We all know the story how Prabhupada, our spiritual master, was walking along with his friend's friend, Narendra Nath Mulik. Narendra Nath said to Prabhupada, Oh, there's a very nice saintly person. He's giving discourses. Let us go. Prabhupada said, I know all about these saintly persons. I'm not going. Because <laughs> Prabhupada, when he was growing up, his father was very accommodating. Any time any sadhus would come, they would come to his house and he would give them and take and give them whatever they wanted. So he was always hosting sadhus. But you know, they were all kinds of sadhus, and these Himalaya Babajis who smoke hashish <laughs> like that. So Prabhupada wasn't so impressed by these sadhus as he was growing up. So when his friend said, Let's go, he said, You go. But then Narendranath he decided, no, you're going to come with me. So he grabbed him by the arm and pulled him. <laughs> he said, you're coming. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, I came. And when I got there, I saw there was a gathering. There was a very saintly person speaking. So I walked in, and I offered my respects. And I was, as I was offering my respects, he spoke to me. He said, you are a very intelligent person. You should take Lord Chaitanya's mission to the Western world. And Prabhupada said, I was shocked. <laughs> we haven't even met, and he's already giving me a mission. <laughs> and then Prabhupada got up, he said, well, and then he started thinking how to respond to this. He said, well, we, as a country, India, we are dependent on the British, so who will hear our message? We need Swaraj first, because Prabhupada was a follower of Gandhi. We need to get liberated from the British, and then maybe we will have some voice in the world. Bhakti Siddhanta said, this political party, that political party, this Lord Chaitanya's message cannot wait. And so that planted the seed to the Hare Krishna movement, which developed in 1965 in America. And that was Bhakti Siddhanta who planted that seed in the heart of our spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, who took that, took that instruction as his life and soul and made it his mission in life. And because of that, and this is the Krishna conscious movement worldwide. So these three people, Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, and Bhakti, and Bhakti Vedanta Swami, Srila Prabhupada, these three together brought back Lord Chaitanya's movement and destroyed all of the, when we say bogus, followers of Lord Chaitanya who are claiming allegiance to his teachings and to his mission. So what Bhakti Siddhanta was, and he, Bhakti Siddhanta sent people to India, I mean, I'm sorry, not India, to England, to Burma, to Germany, to France, so many people went out, his, his disciples, to preach, and they all came back. There was a little success in London, but hardly anything. But when Prabhupada came, it, Prabhupada was thinking, hmm, all of my god-brothers, they went, and they came back, 
and they were unsuccessful. So where can I go? I'm going to go to a new place because if I fail, I want to fail in a different place. <laughs> so where can I go? And then he was thinking, I, 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 he said, I was dreaming, I was dreaming, I'm, I was dreaming, I was going to New York, I was going to New York. So Prabhupada chose New York because he thought that's the most important city in the world. So therefore, let me try there. So that, that, that was established by that meeting in 1922 when Prabhupada heard from his spiritual master. Like that. In 1923, he set up the Gaudiya Printing Works in Calcutta and published Srimad Bhagavatam translation and purport. That was Bhakti Siddhanta. Um, he didn't give commentaries. He did give commentaries on on um, Chaitanya Bhagavat, but he didn't give commentaries on Bhagavatam. But he did give, he, yes, he did give commentaries on Bhagavatam, but he didn't do the extensive. Um, in 1924 was his 50th anniversary, his Vyasa Puja. He was now 50 years old. And he gave a famous speech, Be humbler than a blade of grass. And that's a very amazing speech. You should, it's, in, it's written down. And what he was saying, he was saying, he was reflecting how people look at the spiritual master when he sits upon the Vyasa sun and he speaks. Just see, just see the big brute. He is like a zoo animal. He sits on this very fancy seat and people give him all kinds of garlands. And he is obviously, he is very, feeling very proud in mind. <laughs> So he was saying how people see the, the guru sitting on the Vyasa sound and they think, oh, boy, he must think he's really great, you know. <laughs> but he said, and he went on, he goes on, it's a long speech. He, he actually spoke it and later on it was written down. He said, but I will go to how." I will accept perdition, he used that word perdition, means condemnation, in order to take the position so I can preach Krishna consciousness. I'm willing to accept criticism for the position I take in order to expand Lord Chaitanya's movement. So that was the essence of the speech. Uh, so that that's interesting. You should very interest. Called be humbler than the blade of grass. <laughs> in 1924, he located the spot where Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spoke to Lord Rupa Goswami at Dasvamedha Ghat. Lord Chaitanya spoke for ten days and instructed Rupa Goswami in a complete science of bhakti. And later, Rupa Goswami wrote down Bhakti Rasamrita to Cinder. Soon, uh, uh, what was it? Upadesh Amrita and other books, but mostly Bhakti Versamatu Sindha, which is nectar of devotion. That spot was found by Bhakti Siddhanta, and he established a uh, monument there. From the year 1921 to 1925, he did circumambulation of Navadweep following the path of Lord Nityananda when Lord Nityananda took Jiva Goswami on this path. And today, when we go to Mayapur to do the Mayapur Parikrama, we follow that same path that Lord Nityananda took Jiva Goswami around. We follow that same route. And then later, Bhakti Siddhanta, when he came in 1920. One, I think it was here, yeah, 1921. He did a four years, They for, for four years they followed that path and they stopped at different places and lived there for four years traveling. He went, when he was went on Parikram, he came to the Radhagal Vinda temple and there was a huge crowd there and they were criticizing Vaishnavas. So, um, they start throwing rocks at the devotees. <laughs> I think it's bad today. <laughs> they were throwing rocks at the devotees. 
And so the devotees didn't know what to do. So they were trying to get away from these crowds who were quite violent. And then they took shelter of the Radharaman temple. So Radharaman was the only temple that would allow them to come in because all the other temples didn't want to have any problems. So they didn't allow them to come in. Yeah. And from 1925 and 1926, he wrote and spoke on Van Ashram. In 1926, he sent two sannyasis to open preaching centers in Bengal, Bihar, Orissa, and Northwest India, established temples in Namisharanya and in Mayapur. Mayapur is the Sri Chaitanya Mat. 1927, he began a English version of a newspaper he had started earlier called Sajana Toshini, and that became The Harmonist. Mm -hmm. mm. That That paper was... Uh, there was one particular article in that paper that mentions how, how when Srila Prabhupada was uh, Prabhupada's mentioned in there as going to the Western world. Yeah, I think is in the Harmonist. Uh, you can get copies of the Harmonist. The devotees have found all of the copies that were published in the English and have made copies, and it's available. You can get a whole set for your library of the Harmonists. It's in book form. In 1928, Kudu he uh, went to Kudu and on a solar eclipse, he preached to thousands. While experienced an ecstatic mood, he unveiled diorama exhibits. He was the first to establish dioramas. Dioramas are little mannequins or little dolls of Krishna's pastimes. So he would establish that everywhere. And he became actually quite popular for doing that. So he would establish Krishna's pastimes in, in these little doll forms everywhere. And in our Detroit temple, we actually uh, set up a museum where we actually did that also. One devotee learned the science of making these dolls and uh, we have a, if you can go to Detroit Temple in America, there's a, a huge display of these different pastimes of Krishna in doll forms are about this high. And so that became a wonderful way to preach. In 1929, he met one professor who came to see him from America. His name was Professor Southers. He came from... Um, Ohio State University, and he challenged Bhakti Siddhanta by asking him many questions. Bhakti Siddhanta was very respectful and polite and answered all his questions in the most amazing way that this professor was completely shocked. He couldn't believe the answers. Bhakti Siddhanta spoke in high English. His English was so elevated, so, what we say, dictionary English that you couldn't even understand it, even if you were English. <laughs> the, uh, what is it, what is that, the beginning of the Brahma Samhita, right? The, the, the materialistic demeanor cannot reach to the transcendental autocrat who is always inviting the conditioned souls to associate, and then he goes on like that, and, the materialist demeanor cannot approach the transcendental autocrat. So that's us. We're the materialistic demeanor. Transcendental autocrat is Krishna. <laughs> now he, I mean, his writings were like, and when he spoke to this professor in his really high English, the professor was, and what he spoke was so philosophically amazing that this professor you know, when he started traveling in different places in India, he said, I, I met this sadhu. He was like... <laughs> and that discourse you can find, it's mentioned in the book um, on the life of Bhakti Siddhanta called Raya Vishnu, and it's published in other places also. <laughs> uh, in that same year, 1929, he traveled to Lord Chaitanya's birthplace, in 1929, he established 108 Padapitas. 
Parapitas means the footprints of Lord Chaitanya. He put footprints of Lord Chaitanya in 108 places throughout India. And if you travel now, you can still find those Parapitas. When we were in, what was that, in Trivendum Tri Tri in South India, we came across one temple, the Ku uh, King Kulushetra's temple, I think it was Trivendum, yeah. And we saw one of the Padapitas that Lord, that uh, Bhakti Siddhanta had established. And these, these, these are like, just like you see, this is a Padapita here, Lord Prabhupada's footprint. That's what a Padapita is. So the image of the of footprints of Lord Chaitanya, like in the same way, like that, all over India. 108. He preached tremendously. He met governors, viceroys, kings, opened temples, set up dioramas, and he was very big at prasadam distribution. He would collect large amounts of money and just purchase so much food and cook and invite thousands and thousands of people for prasadam. He was very famous for distributing prasadam. People sometimes twenty thousand people would come just for prasadam. So he wanted he wanted to, you know, distribute Krishna's mercy in the form of prasadam. He made a huge diorama, these little dolls in Mayapur, and thousands came. And the theme was Srimad Bhagavatam, which became famous and it stayed for a month and a half. It, it remained open. For a month and a half. Oh my God! I forgot to read the, the back side here. <laughs> uh, hmm, let's see. Should we go back in time? <laughs> and uh, let's see. Oh, uh, well, of course. I think I covered some of the details like that. Oh, in 1904, he toured South India, collected information on rights and rules of the Vedic Tridandic Vaishyap Sannyas. 1905, at the age of 31, he went to a grass hut in the Mayapur area and he chanted 300,000 names of, of Krishna every day, He following in the footsteps of uh, Haridas Thakur. And he stayed there for many, many years, for uh, I forget how many years, but he did one billion names of Krishna. He was preparing for his mission. You can see a picture. He's in this little, kind of like a hut, and it's got a broken roof, and it's raining. And he's there with an umbrella, and he's, chant he's holding the umbrella with one hand, and he's chanting the other hand. And he simply lived on cooked rice for the whole time. That took him nine years. He stayed there for nine years, just chanting the Hare Krishna Maha Mantra. Chaturmasya, he followed the principles of Chaturmasya, cooking rice dried in sun with ghee and ate from the floor. He slept on the hard ground. Okay, let me see here. Okay, yeah. So, we're up to 1930. In 1930, a palatial marble temple was constructed in Bhag Bazar, and three sets of Radha Krishna deities were there. This was given as a donation by a wealthy merchant. In the same year, he preached in Jayapur, Kumarshetra, Simhachala, and Kovor. He opened the Bhaktivinoda Institute, which was a school in 1931. You can still see that school. It's there on right near our temple in Mayapur. He established deities at Alanath. That was a famous story. Where <clears throat> Alanath was the was the deity where when Lord Chaitanya um, was in Jagannath Puri during the Anavatsara. The Anavatsara is when they take Lord Jagannath and they put him in seclusion for two weeks because he gets sick and they give him all kinds of teas and herbs and they repaint the deities. That's just prior to the Ratha Yatra. That's the ceremony. It's, it, we, when we do the Snanyatra, 
that begins the anavatsara. And then we worship the Lord. And when he comes out after two weeks, so for those two weeks is a mood of separation. So Lord Chaitanya went to this one deity, which is near Jagannath Puri. There's a temple called Alanarth. And he, Alanarth is meant, is said to be non-different than Jagannath. So worshiping that deity in separation, Lord Chaitanya stayed for those two weeks every year until the Vrathi Archa started. <coughs> So the temple started to become, what we say, collapsed, and the deity wasn't getting care. So Bhakti Siddhanta came, and he uh, commissioned the building of the temple. And the famous story is that, uh, <laughs> it says here a famous story. What was that famous story? Is that the workers were smoking cigarettes and you know doing their work, but they weren't working fast enough for Bhakti Siddhanta. So he personally started to roll their cigarettes for them so they wouldn't have to waste time rolling it and he would give it to them. <laughs> Which means, you know, you don't go to the store and buy your, your Marlboro or your Winston, you know. <laughs> you take some tobacco and you get some paper and you put it and then you have to roll it and seal it and then you got your beaties, right? <laughs> but the workers were taking too much time to roll, so he said, no, you keep working, I'll roll for you. So he was rolling their cigarettes. <laughs> he wanted that temple built fast. <laughs> so that's, that's the famous story. In the same year, 1931, he sent preachers to Delhi and to the Viceroy of India, Lord Wellington, they met this famous Lord Wellington. That was a famous, you can see, you'll see Lord Wellington walking out of his gate and he's surrounded by Bhakti Siddhanta. That was, that's a famous, just a beautiful picture. Uh, and in the same year, he delivered lectures on Srimad Bhagavatam at a place called Sukaratala. That's the place where Sukadev Goswami spoke Srimad Bhagavatam to Maharaj Parikshit. In the same in the year next year, nineteen thirty-two, he established um, uh, he revised and corrected Professor Sanyal's narration of Sri Krishna Chaitanya, which was a commentary on the Chaitanya Bhagavatam entitled Gaudiya Basya. He also established deities near the site where Ramananda Roy and Lord Chaitanya met and that's the famous discussion. Later, Srila Prabhupada wrote a book based on that discussion. That was his first book he ever wrote. That was in the 1940s. So Prabhupada wrote a book in 1940s on the discussion between, and that book is also published in circles or circulates around ISKCON. Um, uh, this uh, Sanyal, he, he was a he was a disciple of Bhakti Siddhanta also, and he was a professor. And he wrote this Chaitanya Bhagwat. I remember when we uh, first started our Krishna consciousness back in 1973, we didn't have a Chaitanya Charitamrita at that time published. So we were using Professor Sanyal's version of Chaitanya Charitamrita, which was more like teachings of Lord Chaitanya, which was nice. Mm -hmm. he, re he actually wrote quite interesting. That was our Shastra at that time. In May of 1930, well, no, so from October to November 1932, he did a famous Vraj Mandala Parikram, 68 miles circumambulation from October 9th to November 11th. 18 sannyasis came. And people, the caste Brahmins were angry. They threw rocks at them. And it was only because of all the temples closed their doors to them except the Radharaman temple like that. That was that famous story where um, one night <clears throat> they had made an announcement that um, the buses will be going to the Shaita Shai Vishnu temple 
at 7 o'clock. So everyone who wants to come be at the buses at 7 o'clock. And Guru Maharaj will also be giving a lecture in the tent at 7 o'clock. So Prabhupada talks about this. He said most, most of them, every, all of the God brothers, they all went to the Seshu Sai Vishnu temple. But I was thinking, what is this deity? I want to hear from my Guru Maharaj. <laughs> so he came and he would listen. And when he was recommended for, Prabhupada got initiated in 1932 or 31, I'm not sure. And uh, when he was recommended, Bhakti Siddhanta said, Oh, yes, he likes to hear. He likes to hear. Now, this is a qual very good quality of a Vaishnava, those who like to hear. So you're all here and you're listening. That means you're all great devotees. You like to hear. And, and there's so many other people who could be here to hear, but they're not because they don't like to hear. <laughs> so that is, a, and then Bhakti Siddhanta noted that quality in our Srila Prabhupada. And he would always come to listen. And ba Prabhupada would say, sometimes he would be speaking in this very high English, and I couldn't understand what he was saying. <laughs> but still, I would like to hear. <laughs> Yeah. So yeah, so that was in 1932. Uh, <clears throat> uh, let's see what else. Uh, he he went to Allahabad, of course. Okay, in 1932, he had an encounter with Subhas Chander Bose. Mm -hmm. Subhas Chander Bose, if you know him. It wasn't Gandhi who kicked out the British from India. It was Subhas Chandra Bose who kicked out the British from India. Gandhi's movement failed, basically. His movement was nonviolent resistance. Don't, buy, don't do anything that the British won. Don't go to British schools. Don't buy British products. Don't do anything. So they were resisting in a nonviolent way. But the British kept on. But Subhas Chandra Bose, he was a militant. He was born in Bengal. And during what he did was he, he uh, when the war was going on, and uh, this was later on in the 1940s when the Second War, World War was going on, uh, he made a pact with the Germans. And he said, any... Indians, soldiers that you capture that are fighting against you on the British side, then you give them to me and I will make an army and fight against the British with them. And so he developed his own army because the Germans would capture the Indian soldiers fighting against them and they would give them to Subhas Chandra Bose who would train them to fight against the British. And in that way, that's what kicked the British out of India. That was the only reason the British couldn't, they couldn't, they were fighting the Germans on one side and they were fighting Subhas Chandra's army on the other side. And therefore they couldn't win, so they, they actually decided to pull out of India. Prabhupada makes that point, yeah. So Subhas Chandra Bose, and this says here, Bhakti Siddhanta actually met him in 1932. It, was, it wasn't until 1940s that the war was going on. <clears throat> in 1933, there was a large diorama exhibit in Dhaka, and he spoke for one month every day to large crowds. He also spoke on Srimad Bhagavatam during that time, and he spoke on the first verse of Srimad Bhagavatam for three months. The first verse, and it wasn't purports, just, you know, you know, uh, what is that verse? Who knows that verse? Janma, Janma, Yasya, Yataha. Uh, what is the first word of that verse? The first verse in Srimad Bhagavatam. Mm. Tene Brahma Ida Kavaya, Tene Brahma Ida Yat Kavaya, and goes on. Dwam the Swaina Sadak Kukakam 
satyam param dimahi. Yeah. It's a long verse, and that establishes Srimad Bhagavatam and Krishna as being non-different, and Krishna uh, representing Srimad Bhagavatam, and Bhagavatam representing Krishna. And first three verses, actually. But he spoke on the first verse for three months, not covering the same points each day. That was in a place called Dhaka, we were in the, we went there. We actually saw the place that he spoke. That's in that's in ba Bangladesh. On March 18, 1933, he spoke to, spoke to two sannyasis and one disciple. I'm preaching in the West, in Madras. Sri Pad Bhakti Pradeep Titar Maharaj, Sri Pad Bhakti Hridri Ban Maharaj, and Sri. Sambhidananda Prabhu. They went to London, Germany, and France, set up a small south later. Bhakti Sangar went to London, met the king and queen of England, and they also met Lord Jetland. <laughs> that famous discussion with Lord Jetland, when Lord Jetland, he had spent some time in India, so now he was back in London. So when he met the devotees, he became a little interested. So he said to Bhakti Siddhanta's disciples, he said to actually to Bhakti Sangara, he said, uh, Can you make me a Brahmana? <laughs> Could you make me a Brahmana? That's as English as I can get. I say, Can you make me a Brahmana? <laughs> And Bhakti Sagara said, yes, <laughs> we can make you a Brahmana. What do I have to do? <laughs> well, no illicit sex, no meat eating, no intoxication, no gambling. Impossible. <laughs> That's our life. <laughs> Impossible. <laughs> so Prabhupada said, when I came to America, I was going to give the Westerners something impossible. <laughs> but let me try anyway. <laughs> so yeah, that was a nice discussion between Lord Jetland. Lord Jetland flatly refused. This is what we do. <laughs> this is our life. <laughs> so yeah. So that was that. They they didn't have much luck in. They met the king, the queen, many lords. They actually set up a little preaching center, but then they all came back and they were glorified as being successful. But nothing really happened. <laughs> in uh, August twenty seventh, nineteen thirty three. The appearance day of Bhakti Vinod Thakur, Bhakti Siddhanta delivered a famous lecture called The Vedanta, Morphology and Ontology, and, and that's been reprinted in Back to Godhead in the 1960s. In September of the same year, he did boat sankirtan, and he had two boats, one was called Leela and the other one was called Suradam. In 1933, he performed Nabadweep Mandu Parikram and preached boldly, and he was attacked by hired gundas. They wanted to kill him. Bhakti Siddhanta's life was really threatened because he was preaching against all of these bogus people directly. He was known as Lion Guru. He was fearless. He wasn't afraid of telling everybody, you're a rascal. <laughs> You were a cheater. <laughs> he wasn't. He would tell him straight, and, and so you know. He said, "One time, of course, there's that famous uh, story where some gundas came to the police and said, here is twenty-five thousand rupees. We will give it to you, but we want to do something to Bhakti Siddhanta. Please do not uh, arrest us." The police officer said to the the gundas, uh, for a saintly person, I cannot do it. 
And so he refused to give them protection. And then he went to Bhakti Siddhant and he said, take care, these men are out to kill you. Because then the police officer said, generally we take these things, but not for a saintly person. <laughs> and so, yeah. So he warned Bhakti Siddhant because they had tried. And then because of that, he, he escaped these persons. In 1934, Maharaj of Tipur visited him and heard from him. That was the Maharaj of Tipura, which was a political leader. In 1934, he, in Yoga Pit, he was digging at Yoga Pit and he discovered a four-armed deity of a Hoksaja Vishnu, uh, which was the deity that was worshipped by Jagannath Mishra, the father of Lord Chaitanya. He found it in the ground, and he established that deity. It's still there, in uh, and at the yoga pit in uh, Mayapur. Um, in the, in the same year, in, um, 1934, he discovered the site where Srila Rupa Goswami had darshan with the Gopal deity in Mathura. In 1934, that same year, he preached in pre sent preachers to Germany to deliver lectures at universities. In 1935, the governor of Bengal met Bhakti Siddhanta at Sridham Mayapur. In the same year, 1935, he composed a famous poem called Absolute Ascentient. Um, that was, oh, our Prabhupada. Our Prabhupada on the on the Vyas Puja day of his spiritual master, he composed this famous program called Absolute is Sentient. And then in that poem there's that one line, Absolute is Sentient, thou has proved in personal calamity thou has moved. When Bhakti Siddhanta read that Vyas Puja offering by our Srila Prabhupada, he said, He has understood my mind. <laughs> He has understood my mind. In June 1935, there was the first radio broadcast of Harinam Sankirtan, same year. And same year, he completed 12 cantos, editing of Srimad Bhagavatam with commentaries by Vishwanath Chakravarti Thakur, and poor reports with, which contains commentaries by Madhvacharya. In that same year, which was a famous, you can see it, he did a parikram in Radha Kund. He stayed there for one month, and that's when he met Srila Prabhupada. Prabhupada came with his little son. You can see the picture. They're walking together on the banks of Radha Kund. Bhakti Siddhanta is overwhelmed with anxiety. He's very unhappy. And he turns to Prabhupada and he said, Agun Jwalbe. <laughs> which means there's fire in the moth. As we mentioned, in 1930, they got this beautiful marble building given by a rich merchant. And the devotees, before that, they were living very simple and huts and preaching. Now they had this beautiful building and the devotees were fighting amongst each other. This is my room, this is my room. So the preaching started to go down because there was too much infighting between the different devotees. So that disturbed Bhakti Siddhanta. So he said to our Prabhupada, who met him in Radhakuni, he said, if, whenever you get money, print books. Print books. He said, the Murdanga drum, you can play it, and you can hear it from a distance, but then the printing press is the big Murdanga. The printing press could be heard all over the world. Well, Prabhupada took that as the prime part of his mission to print books and to distribute books. And because of that, our movement has become famous and has grown all around the world because of printing and distributing books. So Prabhupada gave, got that instruction directly from his spiritual master and he made that his mission in spreading Krishna consciousness in the West. In November 6th of the same year, 1935, he established a Pushpa Samadhi for Bhakti Vinod Thakur. At, and uh, 
And of course, in 19, uh, he established 64 temples all over India. The preaching was amazing. He had an army of sannyasis. They were traveling all over India, preaching Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teachings. They were opening temples. The movement was spreading like crazy until that stuff and, and, and happened. But then in 19, and November 6th of that same year, 1935, I think it was? Yes, he developed a heart condition. So he had, he had some heart problems. In 1936, he sent Bhakti Sangara Maharaj to England. We mentioned that. He went to Jagannath Puri for a month, gave a lecture for one and a half months. And December 6th, he went to Calcutta, gave long lectures, personal instructions. And he wrote, and he quoted from Bhakti Vinod Thakur's Dainya Humility six times. And he established, not established, but he said, when I leave, you must manage by establishing a governing board commission. He told his leading disciples, don't try to become the next guru. Collectively come together and establishing a governing boarding commission to manage the preaching, manage the society. They failed to do that. And because of that, they didn't listen to their spiritual master. They committed an offense by disobeying his instructions. And there was fights between the leading disciples. Uh, one was Kunja Bihari. I can't remember the other one's name. But they were fighting. Both of them were qualified uh, preachers, powerful preachers. They all, they all wanted to be the next guru in the moth. And it turned into court cases. And it stayed in the courts for 20 years. And because of that, the whole Gaudiya moth which was really powerful, started to disintegrate. And that's why Prabhupada went to America. He didn't connect himself with the Gaudiya math. He started all over again. He didn't want to be associated with his God brothers and his, their movement because they had disobeyed their spiritual master. And they were no longer preaching. They were simply maintaining their temples and having their individual mosques. And that's all that was going on. Hardly anything was happening. There's that famous, in 1959, when they had a Vyasa Puja offering for their spiritual master, Bhakti Siddhanta, Prabhupada spoke to all his god brothers, and he blasted them. <laughs> he said, you're simply satisfied and just ringing the bells in the temple. But that is not our mission. Our mission is to go out and preach Krishna conscious. The preaching has stopped. And then he also wrote that p poem, which is a glorification to his spiritual master. I can't remember the name of the poem, but it was a beautiful, beautiful expression of how, what Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati wanted and what was going on instead. And he really blasted, well not blasted, but clearly showed how they had failed to follow the spiritual master. And when you fail to follow the instructions of the spiritual master, you become asara, useless. You don't have any situation anywhere. Even if you try to do something on your own, you will not be able to have any success because you don't have any empowerment. The empowerment comes from Krishna and the connection is through your spiritual master. When you're connected to your spiritual master, you are powerful because he's connected to Krishna. That's where the power comes from, from Krishna, through the disciplic succession. So they failed and therefore, Prabhupada talks about it in Chaitanya Charitamrita, how for years and years and years there was just court cases. And Prabhupada went to America in 1965 and began the International Society for Krishna Conscious. Started, which is an extension of the Gaudiya Math, but he did it individually. And he asked, when he went to America, he asked his god brothers to give him help. 
send books, send men. I can start nice, we can start preaching here in the West. It looks like it's a right place. People are interested in, in, uh, in uh, Eastern philosophy. But nobody listened to Prabhupada. Prabhupada did it on his own. He got no support, no support. They had promised him some support, but when it came time to give it, no one. Prabhupada wanted to build a temple in New York, and he had all the ideas, even the place, but no support. So he did it himself. In December 31st of that same year, uh, actually December 13th of, the, of 1936, he gave a long series of lectures in, the, in an auditorium outlining all everything that he had taught previously. In the same year, December 31st, he disappeared. His disappearance uh, was very uh, powerful. This is... Uh, he requested Sridhar Swami to sing Sri Rupa Manjari Pada. He requested uh, Naveen Krishna V. Lankara to sing Sri Shastaka. And he also had someone sing Yasomati Nandana. He loved that song, Nam Kirtan. On Thursday, January 1st, 1937, at 5.30 a.m., he entered into the eternal pastimes of Lord Garanga, alluring, chanting the holy name, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare. Hare Rama, Hare Nama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. And so he lived by Trinadapi Sunichena. There's much more I have, there's additional, but I'll just kind of summarize. He set up, he did 17 Navadweep Mandala Parikrams. He did 60, he opened 64 temples. Again, his favorite songs were Yasumati Nandan Sri Rupa Manjari Pada, established samadhis. He printed the works of the previous acharyas. And there was so many, he opened temples, festivals, magazines, newspapers, books wrote commentaries, wrote critiques, and was undying in his preaching. He never stopped preaching. And he, he created an army of sannyasis. <laughs> Prabhupada created an army of grihastas. <laughs> and Prabhupada's grihastas were the ones that brought Krishna consciousness to the Western world, yeah. When he sent three Grihasta couples to London, they opened up London. And he sent one person to Germany, Grihasta, he opened up Germany. So Prabhupada used his Grihastas. And also his brahmacharis were also there. So, so um, the life of Bhakti Siddhanta is a legend. There's so much to it. I just touched the surface. There's much more. There's a beautiful, beautiful book. I don't know if anybody has it here. I haven't seen it. It's about this big. And it's about this. If you come to my apartment, I can show it to you. It's really, it's done on the life of Bhakti Siddhanta. It's really, it gets to the essence and has so many beautiful pictures. Consciousness is now in the world. It was our spiritual master who took his instructions on his head and made his life mission. Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati knew he was the one. When someone said to Bhakti Siddhanta, oh, this Abhai Prabhupada, we should make him temple president. He's very, you know, qualified. He said, no, no, you just let him go Later on, he will do everything. <laughs> he will do everything. <laughs> and he did. He took Bhakti Siddhanta's mission and spread it all around the world. So these three people, Bhakti Siddhanta, Bhakti Manoha Thakur, and Srila Prabhupada, these three brought Lord Chaitanya's movement back. 
And because of that, it's spreading all around the world again. Uh, so uh, we were in the midst of a great historical development, and it's our job to keep it going. <laughs> it's We have a great legacy upon our head to keep Lord Chaitanya's movement alive. But Lord Chaitanya is so powerful, he doesn't need us. <laughs> but he uses his devotees to spread his movement. So Prabhupada said, he said, your children's children, speaking to my generation, he said, your children's children will take Krishna consciousness and spread it all over the world. So that means my God brothers and God sisters who have families, their children and their children of their children will take Krishna consciousness all over the world, around the world. That's what he said. And we're seeing that already. We're seeing that already, but it's still, it's our job. You're the children of the children, but then your children, when you have children, that's the children of the children that will take Krishna consciousness around the world. So, um, yeah, that's Lord Chaitanya's mission. Every town and village, there will be the chanting of the holy names of the Lord. So Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was the powerful building block. Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati really worked so hard and did so much to bring Lord Chaitanya's movement back in a very powerful way. And Srila Prabhupada took it and ran with it and spread it all over the world. Yeah, it's amazing. So we are <laughs> lucky, <laughs> you might say, to be in the midst of a great historical development. And the world right now is in a pretty sad state. But the sad state is just the darkness that is covering the world. And this darkness will go on for some time. And it'll get darker. It's going to get much darker than it is now. The demons have a plan, and they have a big plan to subjugate the whole world. But that will precede Lord Chaitanya's movement, because that darkness will eventually fade and collapse. But it's up to us, as followers of Lord Chaitanya, Srila Prabhupada, to bring in the light of Krishna consciousness. So that's our mission. And even if we die doing it, it's glorious. <laughs> because it's you're guaranteed to go back home, back to God. <laughs> it's glorious. So keep distributing books. Preach Krishna consciousness as much as you can. And spread, especially spread the Harinam everywhere. Every town and village. Because we don't know. We, we go out on Harinam, we come back. But... What you do in the two or three hours you're in whatever place, you're, you're actually purifying that atmosphere, you're purifying the people who hear. And Lord Chaitanya is very pleased with that. So every Harinam is a great, great, powerful push in bringing Lord Chaitanya's movement closer and closer to every town and village. It will happen. Because Lord Chaitanya is Krishna himself. When he says it'll happen, it will happen. But <clears throat> just like when someone asked Srila Prabhupada, Lord Chaitanya was here and he could have spread Krishna consciousness all around the world. Why didn't he do it? <laughs> Prabhupada said, he left it for me. So Prabhupada could have stayed and did it, but he left it for us. <laughs> so we have that legacy. It's our responsibility to see what we can do in whatever way we can do it to make Lord Chaitanya's movement. And that's glorious because people are suffering and there's no solution. There's no political solution. There's no economic solution. There's no social adjustments. Nothing can, can actually improve the quality of life in the world except spirituality 
and many of the major religions have compromised their teachings in order to work along with the political and social atmosphere of the world's governments together. If we go that way, then we will become asara, or useless. We have to say free from any political influences and just preach Krishna consciousness as Lord Chaitanya has taught. And that's powerful. Because Lord Chaitanya is there. <laughs> okay, so, so today is a very auspicious day, but it's also a great glorious day because to glorify Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati means to glorify Srila Prabhupada and the entire disciplic succession. He was not just another guru, he came from the spiritual world to do this work. He's a Nitya Siddha. <laughs> and when it was time, he went back. <laughs> Hare Krishna. So, um, we have our next program is at 11.30, is it? So that's Push Punjali and... Hmm? Volga Offering. What, what's the, what time should the devotees assemble? 11.34. Guru Oh, Guru Asaka? Oh, okay. So be here at 11.30 for a one-hour ceremony. And then there will be a nice feast, I guess, in honor of Bhakti Siddhanta's appearance day. Okay, so thank you for attending. Nice to see so many devotees here this morning. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati Maharaj.